Okay, class, uh, today we're going to look at the 1890s. We're going to look at, um, this is the, the last uh, of our um, Gilded Age units. Uh, this was a, a, a unit that we weren't able to fit in uh, in, la in the last exam. So what we're going to do, I'm going to go over this really quickly. And, and I, I ultimately want everyone to um, take notes today and with the understanding that we will uh, take a quiz over this content on uh, next week next week so make sure you take good notes and uh, if you have any questions regarding any of the content uh, you can come in see me Monday morning uh, where I will uh, be available to answer whatever it is you need. So, um, so ultimately, you know, the the story of the Gilded Age is the story of economic success in the country. Um, it is a triumph of capitalism, but like any capitalist system, uh, we're, you're going to have obviously your your boom cycles, uh, periods of of wealth generation followed by bus cycles. So really the United States economy is, is and the story of the United States is really the study of, is really of the boom and bus cycles in the US economy. That there were two uh, bust cycles in the Gilded Age. Uh, one is the Panic of 1873, which was fairly small. Uh, and the the panic of 1893, which was actually actually you know prior to the Great Depression, it will be the largest economic depression um, up to that point. And currently today, I mean, if you if you look at all economic downturns in American history, the panic of 1893 is the second worst economy in American history. So. Um, we're going to look at that, but before we do that, I, I, I'm going to go through this. This PowerPoint is on my Google site uh, under the 1890s. I am going to uh, skip quite a bit um, in, in large part because a lot of this stuff isn't on the AP exam. And so what I go over this morning, uh, you are accountable for, okay? Um, what you're accountable for. So we're going to skip over Benjamin Harrison here. Uh, and we are going to scoot uh, to the, the 1893. So really, uh, depression of 1893. Now, the most, the biggest political issue of the 1870s and the 1890s, remember these are the, the two decades which will feature a bust cycle, uh, is going to be the issue of currency. Uh, the value of currency. So to, really the, the story of the 1890s is going to be a story of currency. Um, so um, so either way, what we're looking at is um, 1893, we're going to find a lot of discontent in America, economic discontent. A lot of the bust or the boom uh, a lot of the boom is going to become bust so as it says here 1893 one of the most devastating panics in history uh, it, it really got initiated with a major strike uh, the Pullman strike uh, a strike that we learned about last unit uh, in which quarter of a million workers go on strike uh, millions by 1893, we're going to see millions uh, are going to be laid off and, and lose their jobs. So we're going to see uh, a high level of unemployment. And so one thing you can you can um, I think an important concept you need to understand is that in every depression, an economic downturn, uh, unemployment is is a symptom. Okay, unemployment is a symptom and. And ultimately, uh, laid off railroad laborers began moving east, only to find that there's no jobs. And this, of course, threatened, uh, workers threatened a march on Washington. And as one politician said, 
the smell of revolution is in the air. So what causes the panic of 1893? Overproduction of manufactured goods. And when you make too much of a product, then the price of that product will uh, plummet. Um, the value of it will drop. <clears throat> and so ultimately, because of an, uh, a surplus of manufactured goods, uh, it, it, it caused businesses to go belly up. Uh, the repeal of silver and the money supply, I will explain that later. Uh, the loss of gold reserves, which ultimately causes deflation. We'll talk about that here in a few minutes. And growing unemployment and farm failures. And so every major economic downturn is initiated. Uh, it begins on the farm. It, it, the Great Depression, of the 19 uh, the 1930s began on the farm uh, but but ultimately um, every almost every major panic uh, in American history farmers are often the hardest hit okay so as it says here with the rise of the industrialists American farmers had gradually seen their political clout in Washington diminish significantly uh, the Democratic resurgence in the midterms in 1890 reflected somewhat more of a reaction against the tariff, spoils politics, extravagance, and moralizing. The returns revealed a deep-seated unrest in the farming communities of the South and the West that was the beginning to find voice in the new People's Party, a grassroots movement of considerable political social significance. So, so as early as 1890, you, you start to see trouble brewing where, you, where you, the, the frustrations of the farmers are, are beginning to grow. And, and you can see that by the, the way they voted uh, in those elections. So really, this is a big thing I want to address uh, right now. This is something you're going to need to know. Um, so what were the economic... Um, and social conditions like on the farm, okay? So number one, and by the way, this is big. You'll need to know this, okay? So, so what we have leading to the panic of 1893, especially on the farm, is we see a long-term decline in commodity prices. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, when you overproduce, uh, it causes the value of what you're producing to fall. And so your profits, you can't make profits. And another cause in the decline of commodity prices would be growing international competition. Um, so not only is the American farmer and the American businessman working or competing against uh, their fellow Americans, but they, they're also competing in foreign markets. Excuse me. Goodness. Okay, number two, the villains and the middlemen who handled the farmer's products became the prime villains. So this long conflict between the farmers and the railroads is, is going to boil over and, and create a, a, a great amount of discontent on the farm. Uh, number one, the farmers felt victimized by the high railroad rates, okay, uh, by the high railroad rates. And so, which prevailed in the farming regions, hold on. Okay, so they had no alternative. You know, the, the problem is the farmers grew a product, they, they, and the only way they can get their product to market is they had no choice but to use the railroads. So in many ways, the railroads had a monopoly in, in the transportation of their agricultural products to the marketplace, and they oftentimes overcharged them um, and, and charged them inconsistent rates. Also, they felt like the railroad men had more political influence that, you know, in Washington and in their state capitals and on the local level, that the railroad men had more political influence than the farmers did. So they felt like they didn't have a voice. That's going to be very important. As you saw in the previous slide, okay, which you, what we see on the previous slide is that ultimately a byproduct of 
the uh, 1893 uh, depression is it will lead to a uh, third party movement. Okay, a third party movement right here called the People's Party. Now we also refer to this party as the Populist Party. So ultimately what you need to understand is that as the economy begins to tank, uh, different groups of Americans out of frustration uh, come to the conclusion, they, they, they come to the conclusion that they do not have any influence amongst the two major political parties, the Republicans and the Democrats. And so that is what is going to drive the creation of a third party movement. Okay. Another source of economic, uh, their economic and social um, ills, another symptom would be that, you know, as it says, number three, when they went to sell wheat or cotton, the buyer sell, set the price. And when they went to buy a plow point, the seller would set the price. Four, high tariffs resulted in higher price manufactured goods on which farmers depended. And so also they have, you know, farming is an import um, economy and high tariffs have a negative effect on import. So, so they're angry that they're at the mercy of middlemen, the middlemen that handle their crops. They're at the mercy of high tariffs. They're at the mercy of the railroads, right? They've got their crop prices are declining. And so as crop prices decline, uh, their paychecks decline as well. And so the amount of money that they make declines. And so, uh, but number one, I tell you what, man, one of the, one of the major um, consequences, or I wouldn't say consequences, but, but one of the features of misery on the farm is debt. The farmer is always in debt. As it says here, Western farmers had mortgages to cover their debts. Southern farmers uh, and crop liens as crop prices to crop, as Crop prices dropped, the burden of debt grew because farmers had to cultivate more wheat or cotton to raise the same amount of money. By growing more, they furthered the vicious cycle of surpluses and price declines. So um, currency deflation caused um, declining prices. Farm discontent focused on the currency issue. So what I'm going to do real quick, I'm going to go off script here. Okay, go off script a little bit. And let's exit here. Okay. So what I want to do is I'm go here. All right, there we go. I need, let's see. All right. All right, here we are. Okay, all right. So what I'd like to do real quick is uh, I want to show... Okay, I got to figure out how to do this. Um, got to figure out how I'm going to do this. Okay, well, you know what? I am not going to be able to do what I thought I was going to do, but but ultimately, um, let's let's. Well, I'll go back to it. I, I I apologize. Okay, I apologize. Okay, let's go back to our. Um, original slide. Okay. So one thing you got to understand that, that farming is a cycle. Okay. Farming is a cycle. And farmers, they start off the cycle in debt. They have to borrow money from the bank in order to purchase seed uh, and, and all the costs that go in to starting a crop. And as, okay, of course, they put the crops in the ground. They watch them grow. And then when they harvest the crops, 
then they take the profits from their crops to pay for the debt that they incurred on the front end. Okay, now, so the problem is, is that as farm prices, you'll get number one here, that when farm prices, when the prices of crops decline, then their paychecks get smaller. And as the paychecks get smaller, then they lack the ability to pay their debts. So they ultimately, because of these economic conditions, all right, if you look at number five, what happens is that this farmers are going to suffer a, it says here, a, a burden of debt. That each cycle, every time they plant, they, uh, they're unable to produce enough crops in order to pay their debt. So their debts mount. And then ultimately, uh, it says here, they take out mortgages. They take out mortgages to cover their previous year's debts. You know, you know a mortgage, usually when we think of mortgage, we think of that's what people uh, take out in order to buy a house. You know, mortgages are huge expenses. Well, they were essentially um, taking out mortgages just to cover the previous year's debts. And ultimately, I think in the long term, these farmers are unable to cover their debt. So they ultimately lose their farm. They can't pay their mortgages. They lose their farms. And so, and then when they go east to look for jobs, they see that there's no jobs there for them in the, in the factories and, you know, out east um, in that economy. And so, so it's, a, it's a vicious cycle of debt and, and ultimately farm failures. Now, what farmers would do, if you look here, is that they would increase the amount of cultivation. So in order to try to make more money, they would plant more wheat and more cotton or corn or whatever they're, they're, hard, whatever they're, they're producing. And what that did is that created surplus, you know, and surpluses, the higher the surplus, the, 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 the more farm prices decline. Because the, remember, the more you make of something, the more, the more you produce, we call it overproduction up here under number, number one, that the more you produce, right, the, the, it's, it, it causes prices to fall. So it actually makes the, it makes the debt issue, it makes the whole thing worse. All right, makes the whole thing work. So we've got um, a great deal of farm discontent. And, and the farmers believed, if you look at number six here, they believed that the path towards uh, salvation, you know, the way that they can, uh, the solution to all their economic problems uh, resided in the uh, currency issue um, with the currency. Okay. Now, the problem with the nation's currency in the late 19th century was that it lacked the flexibility to grow along with the expanding American economy. Okay. So in other words, from 1865 to 1890, the amount of currency in circulation actually decreases. Okay. From about 30. So if you're going to take all the money in circulation and you divide it up, Per American. In 1865, if you're going to take all the currency in the American economy, $30.20 would go to each American. Whereas in, by 1890, that number has declined to, uh, num to $27.06. So, so ultimately, what, what happens is, you know, what I would normally do if I had the means to, uh, if I had a pen, I would be able to draw it here. Okay, but I don't have a pen, so I can't draw it. But I do have this weird little pointer. Okay, so if you follow me here, if you'll, you know, draw a triangle, okay, you draw a triangle. And so, so what we have is that you've got a fixed amount of currency that's been printed, okay? In say 1865. And by 1890, the amount of money in circulation has actually decreased. So what that means about, okay, I've already made that clear. 
But I'm going to tell you why this is bad, because what happens between 1865 and 1890? What happens to the American economy? Right? It's growing. And so make sure you write this down. This is important. Okay? That as the United States economy grows, so must the money supply. Okay? It's called an elastic money supply. The, the, the amount, so as... As the American economy expands, in theory, the amount of money you put in circulation must expand as well. Okay? It must expand as well. And, and ultimately, what's, what we also have, too, okay, make sure you make a note of this. What, what, what we also have, too, is that between 1865 and 1890, the populations doubled due to immigration and natural increase. So in a nutshell, and this would be important to write down, is that there's a limited amount of cash for more and more people, right? So the country's growing, the population's growing, the economy's growing, but the money supply is not. And that's causing what we call a, uh, a currency pinch. It's, it's a, uh, we got a crunch, we got a money crunch, all right? We got too many people and not enough cash um, and not enough cash to, to go, to go around. And so, um, and, and so ultimately let's talk about currency. There's basically three kinds of currency. You got your greenbacks, which is, that's the, you know, the dollar, that's the amount in circulation. It had been 346 million in 1878, and it remained fixed at that amount, you know, despite people agitating for more more money um, being print being printed. Then you got your nat your national banknotes, which are essentially government bonds. It's essentially it's national banknotes are uh, currency used by government. Uh, to pay off its debts. And then, of course, you have hard money. And hard money is that metallic currency. It is coined by the Mint, the National Mint in Washington, D.C. And they coined money at a 15 to 1 ratio, which meant that for every gold piece you you mint, uh, you got to have 15 silver minted as well. So those are, that's the equivalency that, that 15 silver pieces are the equivalent of one gold piece. And so the phrase free and unlimited coinage simply meant that the owners of precious metals could have any quantity of their gold or silver um, coined for free. You know, so if you have a bunch of uh, gold or silver laying around, um, you could actually take it to the mint and have that coined uh, into currency. And, you know, this is the day of the mining. You know, we got mining out west, and a lot of it is being found out there. So, frustrated by the unwillingness of Congress to ease their plight, disgruntled farmers began to organize after the Civil War. And we know these already. I mean, we have the Granger Movement, which was largely aimed at railroads, the Farmers Alliance, and the Greenback Labor Party. Greenback Labor Party, this was the party that was begging for currency reform. Okay, currency reform. Now, ultimately, the Farmers Alliance, that group that we, we learned about in the New West unit, is going to morph into what we call the Populist Party. Okay, now the, the Farmers Alliance falls, falls apart um, and, and in its place, the Populist Party will take its place. So, we'll, so who are the Populists? Uh, I'll talk about this. Um, up here in just a second, but the populist party, who are they? You know what, basically these are people 
who had lost faith in both the Republican and the Democratic parties. Free laborers, Farmers Alliance members, disenfranchised whites, women, and blacks. Okay, so these are your voiceless people. Uh, these are your voiceless people, the people who are most adversely affected by these economic conditions um, in the uh, 1890s when the economy tanks. Now, this is a, a very important topic here. Okay, I'm going to, I'm actually going to go off script here. All right, so. I'm going to go to this PowerPoint right here. Okay, I'm going to talk about bimetallism. Okay, we're going to talk about currency. This is, you know, this is probably going to bore half of you to death, but you know, it's it's very very important uh, to understand uh, about uh, monetary issues. And so, essentially, back in those days, money was backed by either gold or silver. Okay. And we call it, when money is backed with gold, it's called the gold standard. Uh, you could actually go to this, this PowerPoint. It's on my 1890s page. It's called Gold Silver. And uh, there's a YouTube video you can watch in which explains what the gold standard is. But essentially, you've got a unit of currency. You know, in this case, it's the dollar in circulation that is backed by a certain amount of gold. Okay. So, for example, if the price for an ounce of gold is $1,000, then the U.S. Treasury could print $1,000 in paper currency for every ounce of gold that it holds in reserve. Now, the amount of paper currency in circulation is limited to the amount of gold that you have in reserve. So, follow along. So it's an increase in the amount of gold can lead to an increase in the money supply. If everything else holds constant, as the money supply rises, the price level rises. In other words, more gold equals more money available equals a growing economy, which ultimately results in inflation. Okay, inflation. So uh, a decrease in the amount of monetary gold can lead to a decrease in the money supply. If everything holds constant, as the supply of money falls, price levels decrease, okay? So if you take money, so let's, let me review this. So if you take money out of circulation, okay? If you shrink the money supply, all right? Prices fall. That's called deflation, okay? But if you increase the money supply, if you take the money supply and you print more money, that the more money you print, that creates inflation. And inflation results in higher prices, okay? So, um, so under this, under, under deflation, less gold means less money which equals stagnant economy, which equals falling prices. And so what, okay. Now, now what if instead of gold, you back money, you back currency with silver, okay? Now, it, Is silver more valuable or less valuable than gold? Less valuable. So if you back the dollar with silver, is it, going to, is it going to lead to deflation or inflation? It leads to inflation. And what happens to prices under inflation? Does it go up or go down? goes up. So what's the problem with the farmers? The problem with the farmers is that they're in debt. They have bills they can't pay. They've got mortgage after mortgage after mortgage. And so they believe that currency reform is their ticket to prosperity. And what they mean by currency reform is they want the dollar 
not to be backed with gold, but they want the dollar to be backed with silver. Because when you back the dollar with silver, then the government will print more money, right? You'll have a larger money supply, which will ultimately cause inflation. Inflation causes prices to increase. And when prices increase, so do the size of their paychecks. Farmers' paychecks go up. Inflation also causes wages to go up. Naturally, it naturally causes wages to go up. So factory workers, they wanted inflation. They wanted silver because silver would cause wages to go up. What stays fixed? Their debt. But with inflation, their paychecks increase. <clears throat> and they believe that this is going to help them alleviate their debt. So who is most, most supportive of bimetallism, silver, Western farmers. As it says here, the price of food will increase so that they make more money on their crops, which would help them uh, pay back their mortgages and their farm loans, because they can now pay back these mortgages and farm loans with cheap dollars. Now, when we talk about cheap money, cheap money is money that's being printed because of inflation. Okay. That means the value of the dollar is low. And when the value of the dollar is low, we have inflation. When you take money, when the value of the dollar is high, when the dollar is worth more, then prices decrease. And that causes deflation. So why the farmers want inflation? Okay. So... You can kind of go on, the, go through this uh, on your own here at home. But this this kind of gives you, uh, uh, you can go through it. It talks about your budget, part income from crop, $800. These are your expenses, variable expenses, fixed expenses. You got a net income of $0, right? So, so if you... And that's, of course, say in 1866. So there was a bad recession, 1893, which caused deflation. Deflation affects both the value of your crop as well as the value of other various goods you buy. Let's assume that there's a 10% deflation rate. How does this affect your income and your variable expenses? Your income goes down. Expenses. $765. If I add that correctly, that's $765. That means each year I grow, I produce, I'm going $45 in the hole. So what would inflation do? So to help solve the problem of deflated currency, the populist party wanted to add silver to the gold standard. This would allow more paper money to be printed. It would help lead to inflation. So let's assume there's a 20% inflation rate. And based on 1894 numbers, what does it do to your income and variable expenses? So I go from going $45 in a hole to having a $36 profit after all my debts and all my bills are paid. And that's just by adding inflation into the mix. Okay, so you can see the price, for example, you see the price of uh, wheat per bushel in 1866. If you harvested 2,000 bushels, the price was $2.06 a bushel. Your income, $4,120. However, in 1894, which is, again, at this time, it's the worst economic depression in the history of the United States. Prices had fallen to 49 cents a bushel. So at the same numbers, 2,000 bushels, paycheck just fell. Look how much it fell, $980. And look how long it takes to recover. 
1904, I mean, we're still, we're not at 1866 levels, okay? So there's a lot of pain and misery on the farm, okay? Look at that, $2,000 in the hole. The big, big difference, you go from these farmers making $120 a year to going $2,000 in the hole every year that they produce. And ultimately they, they just can't pay their debts and they, they go broke. So who does inflation hurt? It hurts banks, because now loans are now paid back with cheap money. Interest rates are lower, which cuts into their profits. Eastern wage earners, food costs more, but wages don't keep up with inflation. And anyone with cash deposits in the bank. Okay. I'm going to pass this up. So the discontent, um, new political parties form the populist or the people's party. Um, a short-lived agrarian-centered uh, political party that most historians agree was on the left wing, radical spectrum of American politics. It was highly critical of capitalism, especially banks and railroads, and they allied itself with the labor movement. They promoted free and unlimited coinage of silver. So they're silverites, they want silver. Why? Because they want inflation. Okay, okay, let's see. Eighteen ninety two, we have the first ever populist candidate for president. Here he is, James Weaver. He's runs he's a former uh, Civil War general, and he's gonna represent the populace. He's a silver guy. Now, why do we have to have a third party? The reason why we have to have a third party is because these two guys they support gold. They don't support silver. He's the only candidate in the race who supports in introducing silver into the currency debate. Okay, you can see where the electoral votes, you know, that he becomes, uh, Weaver becomes the first third party candidate to actually win electoral votes. It's a rising political movement. So the president, Cleveland, I don't know what's going on with this PowerPoint. Economic depression in 1890 was caused by overbuilding, over speculation, ongoing agricultural depression. We've got labor disputes, you know, so we've got the Homestead strike. We've got the Pullman strike. So there's thousands of strikes that are crippling the nation. Um, Impact as a result, 8,000 businesses closed in six months. 25% of railroads went under. And look what happens with unemployment. Unemployment rates peak at almost 9.5%. Uh, and so ultimately, the, 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 the goal is okay. So let me. Okay. Now, eventually, 1896, uh, we have a populist that runs for president representing silver, and his name is William Jennings Bryan. And the only the, the good thing is for this group is that he's also a Democrat. So they, there is no third party running in 1896 because the Democrats nominated a populist, uh, William Jennings Bryan. Uh, a uh, actually a, a fundamentalist Christian from Nebraska representing the farm regions. Uh, he was favored by the farmers and he supported silver. His opponent from Ohio, Republican, he was favored by the Eastern political bosses and ultimately favored gold. So the election of 1896 is all about the issue of gold or silver, bimetallism. Do we pick gold or silver? or both. And William Jennings Bryan 
went around the country. You see here, he's giving his speech. Uh, his stump speech is one of your note card terms. It's called the uh, cross of gold speech. Um, it's one of your outside readings. And so in the cross of gold speech, he basically uses this, this metaphor that uh, as Christ gave, you know, as, as you know, you think about the, the symbolism of the cross. He said that every day, working men and women and farmers are being crucified on a cross of gold. Talk about the gold standard. It's killing them. It's killing them economically. And we've got, we've got to have silver. Okay. So ultimately, Mr. McKinley wins. McKinley wins very close. Uh, I mean, the Electoral College, what, not so much. Popular vote, fairly close. Um, but William Jennings Bryan is defeated. McKinley wins, and the gold-silver issue dies out because the economy will eventually improve. As the economy improves, then the cries for silver kind of fall off. Okay? They fall off. Okay, so Frank Baum of Wizard of Oz fame wrote a parable, which is really about the gold-silver issue. The story behind Wizard of Oz. So I've got a link here to the story behind the Wizard of Oz. Oz, O-Z, an abbreviation for ounces. So basically... This story is really about the gold-silver debate, okay? It's all about the gold-silver debate. It's about Dorothy and her, her companions taking the yellow brick road, yellow brick, this is gold, right? The yellow brick road to Emerald City. Emerald City is Washington, D.C., because that's where the money is. And emerald is the color of money. And, of course, Oz is O-Z. That's what these metals are measured in, they're measured in ounces, okay? So traveling east on a road made of gold, facing dangers along the way, these people are heading to see the wizard, okay? They're, they're on their way to see the wizard, okay? Dorothy represents just your average, ordinary rural citizens, okay? These ordinary people, Okay, who are kind of naive. They're really naive, kind of like a little little farm girl. That's that. So the the naivety that uh, they uh, that you see in the movie uh, really is how Baum sees rural Americans. That they're kind of they're kind of clueless. Scarecrow represents farmers. The Tin Man. City workers, industrial workers, right? He needs oil. Keep his moving parts going, right? Keep his moving parts going. The lion, the cowardly lion, William Jennings Bryan, whom Baum is not a huge fan for. He's like, really? This guy's speaking for us. The dude has got no courage. No courage. He's all roar. He's not strong. He's all roar. He, he roars loud, but he he can't back up his roar. There's the Emerald City, Washington, D.C., the wizard. Now, there's different um, interpretations as to who the wizard is. Uh, many say it's William McKinley. Others think that it's uh, the head of the Democratic Party. Uh, it was a senator by the name of Mark Hanna. Um Others see it, as you see here, as the evil Eastern bankers who are manipulating the economy by pulling strings and levers behind the curtain. In the book, Dorothy's slippers are silver. They're not ruby. After Dorothy and her companions expose the wizard and the gold standard as a fraud, Everything is all right, and the world of Dorothy is wonderful, thanks to her ruby slippers. So, um, kind of further, you know, the, the, the monkeys, the flying monkeys, they're the Native Americans. The Wicked Witch of the uh, West 
is the basically the West. It's the bad climate. It's the mugs. It's it's everything that's that goes all the challenges of farming. Um, the the wicked witch of the North are your industrial leaders, your bankers. Your wicked witch of the East are the bankers. The wicked witch of the North are the industrialists. So everyone in the book is representative of what's going on during that period. Okay. Okay, so let me go back here. I'm almost done. So the populists run in 1892. That's the first time they run. Um, and they run under a platform called the Omaha Platform. Okay. And the Omaha Platform, I actually have the Omaha Platform right here on the 1890s page right there. And that's one of your outside readings. And I downloaded it here. So it kind of tells you the platform kind of talking about that the populace not only supported silver, there were other reforms that they were deeply, deeply committed to. They wanted, for example, an income tax. They wanted federal loans to farmers. You know, they wanted civil service reform. They wanted the government to come over and take over the railroads and the telephone and telegraph companies to nationalize these industries, you know, immigration restrictions. They wanted a ban of the use of private armies in their crushing of strikes. They wanted an eight hour day, a single six year term for president. They wanted senators to be directly elected by the people and not by the state legislatures, you know. They wanted uh, initiative and uh, ref referendums, the right of, and we'll talk about this in the progressive era. But just know that the the uh, under the Omaha platform, it's very clear that the Populist Party is very much into other reforms. Silver just happens to be their, you know, the silver ticket. I mean, that's their their ticket towards prosperity. That's that's very important uh, to them. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, yeah, so we talked about the strikes, Wizard of Oz, Coxie's Army. Uh, Coxie's Army is actually, in, in 1894, a group of unemployed um, workers marched on Washington. You can see uh, that this picture right here in the uh, bottom left-hand corner. They marched from Ohio to Washington and on the way uh, he gathered people and by the time they got to Washington he had um, he had quite a few people uh, with him and ultimately they uh, the powers that be the police uh, kicked Coxie's army out of DC um, as you see here it says Coxie and other leaders in the movement were arrested uh, the next day for walking on the grass of the U.S. Capitol. Interest in the march and protest rapidly dwindled. And so it's also believed that what Baum did is that as these people, uh, Dorothy and her companions, as they're marching to the Emerald City, that that is kind of symbolic of Jacob Coxey's march, you know, to the federal city, to the federal city. So um, so ultimately, the, the big deal is, is that we want to understand that uh, what forces leads to the populist party. And it's the bad economy of the 1890s. It's the plight of the farmers. Uh, I want you to think about what's going on on the farm uh, that caused them to lose faith in the Republicans and the Democrats in order to form their own party. Um, and then uh, ultimately, uh, we look at their their participation in the uh, presidential election of 1892. Then, of course, in 1896, that's with uh, uh, William Jennings Bryan versus McKinley. Uh, but I do want you to understand the currency issue and, and the, the gold and silver debate and, and what that was all about and uh, why it is that farmers wanted silver and why it is that bankers and industrialists wanted gold. 
Uh, that's that's very important. You're going to need to understand that. Uh, ultimately, the, the populist party kind of implodes. Uh, it dies out. Their ideas don't die. I mean, eventually the two major parties will uh, adopt their ideas, especially the Republicans. They will adopt it um, when we get into the progressive era. Uh, but but ultimately, the, the populist party will fizzle out, I think, in large part because of their, their lack of success on the federal level. Now, I think it's important to understand that the populists did elect people to Congress. They elected people into the state legislatures. They elected uh, officials on the local level. They weren't very successful, obviously, competing for the presidency. But on the grassroots level, uh, they were a force. They were a force. And Republicans and Democrats, they had to change their policy. They had to change um, or else the populist party would have eventually overtaken them. But what does damage to the populist movement is there's a lot of sectional friction within the populist party. They could not agree on two issues. And this is what ultimately destroys the populist party. Number one, they, they couldn't decide, they could not agree whether or not to allow black farmers into their organization. So the, the organization divides over the race issue. Do we involve blacks? And the second, the second is going to be women. Uh, they divided on should women be our leaders? And you can see down here, Mary E. Lease is one of the early leaders of this group. That women, this is where women are getting very politically active. They're, they're appreciating the opportunity to break away from traditional life. And so... Uh, so women are deeply involved in this movement, and they divide as to whether or not women should uh, be a part of this movement. So ultimately, the, the populist party dies in large part due to the race issue, uh, the gender issue, and as I mentioned earlier, the economy improves in 1896, which now this desire for silver is no longer warranted it's no longer warranted so uh but by the time we get but one thing that has definitely happened and i'm going to stop on this point the one thing that definitely happens is that the the gilded age comes to an end in the 1890s in large part due to the economy collapsing people believe that the reason why the economy tanks in the 1890s is because of greed, corruption, because of the economic policies of the Gilded Age. And uh, they, they believe there's just simply too much power in these very large companies, these monopolies. There's just simply too much power in government. There's too much um, inequality. There's too much corruption in business, too much corruption in, in government at all levels. And so as we talked about in class with the Gilded Age, by 1900, Americans come to the conclusion that capitalism is out of control. We are too capitalist. And number two, American democracy is broken. There's too much, too much um, corruption at all levels of government. So that we see that pendulum shift towards progressivism uh, as we leave the 1890s. So if you have any questions, come see me on Monday morning, and I will be glad to uh, answer whatever questions you have. Otherwise, we are taking a quiz over this next week. So good luck, guys. Have a great, great weekend, and I will see you, gang, on Monday. Bye.